If you aren't ready to leave, uh, you'll have to exit through the back of my house. So which door? It's a simple choice. I mean, it's the perfect thrower to me that just keeps you on edge from opening minutes to the end. You have no idea where this fucking thing is going. Yeah, cool. Good. It is uh, so well crafted. So oh, um, thank you for saying so. Congrats. Huge thank congrats. Thank you so much. What, what, what can you say about the origins of this one? That the first mm -hmm. seed, this first seed being planted for this idea. I mean, are you walking out of like a showing of Book of Mormon? And <laughs> like, just hear me out. I mean, I did see Book of Mormon on Easter one year, and that felt very fitting. Um, but no, it's 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 a culmination of Brian and I knowing each other since we. 11 years old mm -hmm. and throughout just our, our lifeline of knowing each other for almost 30 years now, um, having conversations about like heavy ideas about what happens when you die, um, fascinations with religion and the way that that structures every single like piece of our culture and society, discovering like that we had friends that were of all different faiths or non-believers and then ultimately marrying into families of, of different faiths than, than what we originally grew up with in, in Iowa. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a fascination with cult, uh, the idea of like the Nexium cult with Scientology and and all these these infrastructures that that really dictate the way that people believe. And sometimes you don't investigate why you believe what you believe until you're you're later in life. And that's that's always a fascination that we have. You guys cited Contact. Yeah, Jody yeah. Foster yeah. was a big influence yeah. last yeah. time. Yeah. Can you elaborate on, on that? Yeah, yeah, Contact was a movie we saw when we were in uh, middle school, mm -hmm. um, and it was a really profound movie at that age to to see something that was addressing faith and religion in a very kind of sophisticated way, in a way that felt important and intellectual, and um, in a way that felt rare as well, that religion is not usually talked about. Um, and it was kind of, you know, it's Carl Sagan, so there's kind of like this collision of religion and atheism together mm -hmm. in the marriage of that. And another inspiration uh, for us was Inherit the Wind, which is an older mm -hmm. movie that also has that same kind of collision of atheism and religion. and. I don't know, we just saw those movies and just thought like one day it'd be really interesting to try to articulate our feelings about religion and our anxieties, frankly, mm -hmm. it's why, which is why it manifested in kind of a more scary um, horror genre um, style film because we have a lot of anxiety mm -hmm. around um, what happens when you die and we have a lot of anxiety around religion. And, and just having a conversation, an adult conversation in a movie felt so special and so rare to us when we saw Contact. Um, it was a dream to attempt to do that one day. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, anytime you dig into to faith and religion and belief, mm -hmm. it can it can veer into what they say like a, is like a hot topic. So sure, sure yeah. hot buttons. Yeah, yeah. 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 Obviously, yeah. I mean, how much was that sort of a conversation mm -hmm. for you guys throughout the writing process? Are we yeah. you know, are we pushing this too far? Is it going to piss people off? Is it going to yeah, alienate yeah. people? Or can you just not worry about that? I stuff? think we were. Yeah. I think we were open to being provocative. Mm -hmm. I, I think yeah. uh, you know we had talked a lot about David Mamet's Oleana, which is a stage play that. Uh, as legend has it, people would watch it and then leave the play and then get into arguments in the, the parking lot after seeing it. And, mm -hmm. and we think like there's a degree where that kind of conversation can be healthy. I mean, it's certainly not, I don't know, people need to be getting into fist fights after mm -hmm. they see Heretic, but the idea <laughs> that people might be provoked and, and have conversations is really thrilling to us. But th oh. there was a degree at which we approach this with, with a spectrum of, you know, going from non-belief to belief and the, and the different institutions that representing through there, all through the lens of the characters. Like mm -hmm. each Paxton, Barnes, and Reed to us represent different versions of ourselves, but also different versions of where people are in the relationship with, with uh, religion. Um, Reed obviously being a little more overtly like anti-religion, but, but you have Paxton who kind of accepts things for what she sees and Barnes that might be pressure testing things, you know, in, in subtle ways and, and finding ways to like connect the audience in a relatable way to each, each one of those characters. Did you guys consult with any religious or spiritual advisors? Yes, we did. I mean, we, first and foremost, being raised um, Christian, you know, there were a lot of advisors that I feel like we had inherently by, by growing up in, in a church. Um, but then uh, as we got older, um, Brian marrying into a Mormon family, us then having like a huge Mormon circle of friends and, and understanding what that, that culture is like and what those lifestyles are like and what the authenticity is like. Um, one of the greatest blessings that we had on this film was having Chloe and Sophie, who both come from a Mormon background, yeah. and being able to like imbue their characters with that authenticity and that grounded nature, that was incredibly important to us. 
And uh, was that coincidental? Is that what you guys said? Like, did you it not was, during it the was, it, process? Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. It's like we, we debate, like, is it coincidental? It's coincidental in the sense that as we were casting, um, we didn't know, um, you, you know, that they had a Mormon upbringing. But there was something in their performances that we kept responding to that after the fact we realized like, oh, that the thing we were responding to is that that history that they have and that truth that they're able to per, per, uh, portray. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, there's a there's a there's a dialect, there's an accent to what, what a typical kind of like Utah Mormon missionary has. And, and those two just captured it perfectly. Mm -hmm. So we kept coming back to them. And then eventually, as we kind of started to wind down, um, we, we learned that, um, that they were raised in the church. Um, we would have never thought that we could like, let's go find some, you know, more, you know, prior, you know, Mormon um, actors. Like it wasn't really a thought that was in our head, mm -hmm. but we were just kept kind of chasing the truth of what we were seeing in, in their mm -hmm. performances. Were they giving you guys feedback throughout the process? That, that yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I specifically remember um, Chloe coming to us and like pitching, like, "Oh, what if I, I sing this song that we had in like primary?" and 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 being able to uh, tap into like their knowledge base. I mean, is is more vast than than I think our own. You know, you do your best to to research and portray things, but as soon as you have somebody that has actually lived that life. That's where the truth really comes out. And how did how did Hugh Grant coming on board? How did that? How did he evolve that character? Oh, mm -hmm. in, incredible! I mean, Hugh is somebody that like we all have known throughout his career as mostly being in you know ro romantic comedies and being that person. But he has such an intelligence and and a healthy. Um, feeling of like investigating everything to the smallest detail. And you need that when you have a script that is kind of demanding you to perform like a mini stage play every day you're on set. We were shooting, you know, sometimes seven, eight, nine, ten 10 pages of dialogue. And in pre-production, we would trade these extensive emails back and forth about, you know, what's the meaning of this sentence? Or sometimes what's the meaning of this word? Mm -hmm. And he would just do a master class every single time of investigating those things. So once we got on set, he was fully read. He was already prepared to just go into a scene and then listen to the other actors, respond to them in real time, mm -hmm. and just really make sure that there was an authenticity to what he was bringing on the camera. In one of the reactions to the film, I read somebody who's probably my favorite reaction I saw, describe him as the, the most evilest mansplainer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of, uh, he yeah. seems like he's having a lot, of, like, a lot of fun in whatever like yeah. new wave of his career that he's yeah. in. I mean, what kind of energy did, did yeah, he Yeah, I mean, I mean, when we, like starting 10 years ago, like you see, when he did a movie like Cloud Atlas mm -hmm. and he's playing multiple roles, like we're like, this is an actor who's challenging themselves. This is somebody who wants to go for it. And, and year by year by year, ever since then, keeps, you know, turning up the dial on, on what he's doing. So, man, working with him, honestly, dream come true. Um, the most kind of prepared, committed um, actor we've ever really, you know, certainly one of, mm -hmm. if not the uh, most impressive actors um, that we've been lucky enough to work with. And just putting on a master class every day. And the cool the coolest thing about Hugh is that He's living it, <laughs> like he's in the moment in the character, and so every take is different. It's not like mm -hmm. he's doing the exact same thing. He, he's he's feeling it, and if something changes in a scene, like for example, there's a scene where um, Hugh mispronounced um, Maro Maroni, which is a, a, a Mormon term, and 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 he was kind of intentionally doing it to kind of jab at the the actresses. And, and so we whispered in Chloe's ear, we're like, Chloe, correct him on his pronunciation. Cause you would know, and we could kind of feel Chloe's like sitting there, like he's not saying it right. right. So we're like, correct him. <laughs> and so that kind of energy, like when, when something changes in the scene, because he's so present and really read in that moment, the whole scene changes. It's yeah. fascinating to watch. How would you guys say this one evolved, you know, most, mm -hmm. most dramatically from those, yeah. that, those first drafts that you wrote yeah. to what we see on the screen? Mm -hmm. I think there's a degree at which there might be a little more comedy that was evoked from like finally translating it on screen. I mean, I think we, Brian and I knew there's a degree of changing the tones where there's a darkness, but then it kind of turns a corner and there's comedic moments to keep the audience on edge of, are we in a situation that's fine? Or is this turning like a, a corner that we don't want to go down? Mm -hmm. But once you put, you know, Hugh and Sophie and Chloe on screen, they're finding moments in the scene that aren't necessarily scripted because they're trying to listen to each other and because we're running seven to like 
10 minute long takes without interruptions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of the humor comes from just them being real about things. Mm -hmm. Like when Chloe, you know, like Chloe's just, she's so her, she's so Paxton and like just her being like, thanks Mr. Reed, uh, like we'd like mm -hmm. to leave now if <laughs> yes. that's cool with you, you yeah. know, just like, and that's just real. Right. It's not, yeah. it's not like yeah. a joke. It's like, that's how she would try to get out of the situation right. and we find, and that's amusing because we recognize the humanity in it in a you weird way. You feel that, that discomfort feels so real because mm -hmm. you're putting yourself in that moment and you're going like, yeah, like you, you can say like, yeah, I'm just going to run and scream. But yeah. in the moment you're yeah. like, yeah, I don't know for sure that this guy wants exactly. to kill me, but yeah, exactly. yeah. I feel like I should try to navigate this like exactly. diplomatically yeah, exactly. in the moment. Yeah. I mean, you guys have re referenced, you know, how, how dialogue heavy this film mm -hmm. is, it's talky horror, so, mm -hmm. so to speak. Are you guys making up for lost time with the <laughs> A little bit, <laughs> yeah. Like you, if you do enough like nonverbal movies, you yeah. start getting the itch to go the opposite direction. <laughs> yeah. But I, but I think like the challenge with this one was. Um, in the past movies we've done without dialogue, like it's still important to have cinema, like the tools of cinema, how you're moving the camera, the sound design, the music. And and this movie was no different. It's like, it actually was um, a similar challenge where there's so much dialogue that you can't just sit back and just set up a camera and leave it there for, you know, 120 minutes. Yeah. You need to make sure it's evoking something that the characters are going through, like starting to feel that claustrophobia or or starting to feel the sound design evolve to, to scarier and darker places. And so that was a big... Um, big fear I think we had looming over our heads when we were in pre-production is just making sure that this didn't feel like a stage play that was just shot like a stage play, but instead yeah. was was a piece of that's, theater. That's that's what we live yeah. for, like those challenges and those kind of gimmicks. It's like with a quiet place, we were like the the thrill was can you tell a story without dialogue? Mm -hmm. And and I think similarly, the thrill of this was can you make something scary with words and ideas? Mm -hmm. That was just so so you know exciting because it feels like a high wire act and it feels impossible and maybe it is impossible, but it's fun to to try something challenging. The quiet place was obviously so seminal for you guys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, do you th do you guys see sort sort of shared DNA between these two projects besides you know your own DNA? Yeah, I mean I think there's I think there's um, a few superficial uh, connections and then there's some deeper connections. Um, the deeper connections is uh, they both grapple with the sense of loss. Um, I, I think it's something that is just instantaneously relatable to anybody. And and for this this goes a step beyond you know questioning what does happen when you die, which is a question that looms over us anytime we lose a family family member or a friend. They also both felt like big swings. Like when we wrote both scripts, it, they, they both oddly felt like no one's going to make this movie. <laughs> you know, they had like a quality of like, there was something dangerous or left of center about them that yeah. we needed to find in both cases a partner producers and a studio that was like believed in it and mm -hmm. wanted to go for the big swing um, yeah. you know, outside the box in that way. Yeah, and, but I mean watching it like both with an audience like we saw A Quiet Place when it premiered at South by Southwest like six years ago and, and feeling the energy in the room with that audience. Um, it, it, we, were feeling a, uh, we were feeling that same feeling last night, the way that it provokes. And that's one thing that we love about the genre of like a suspense thriller horror film is... It, what we love about cinema. Yeah, really. that's true. Yeah, yeah. That you're able to put something on screen and have this community experience that elevates it and electrifies what you're going through all simultaneously. Yeah, and what I learned about you guys last night, speaking of audiences, you've, you've been doing this since you were like, what, like five or six? Like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In yeah. Iowa, yeah. you were yeah. yeah. making movies. Making movies yeah. together. Yeah, and we yeah. joined forces when we were 11, and then <laughs> it, it just continued from there. So yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. So what, yeah. can you give us like some examples of the the short, like I would, I would assume short films? That you uh, I mean, we did. We, we were actually making, did features. We were, doing, yeah. we were yeah. doing our version of Boogie Nights when we were yeah. in high school. Boogie, we, I mean, <laughs> high school Boogie Nights sounds a little weird. No, let's, let's put it as high school. No, like high school Magnolia. Paul Thomas Anderson. Magnolia. Yeah. Well, no, yeah. I mean, like we were, we had, you know, like we were, like Martin Scorsese was a hero. Yeah. Let's do our Scorsese film. Yeah. But we yeah, were yeah. kids, you know. It was like funny, and we would, we would, um, you know, host premieres in our, yeah. in our local hometown, and people would be like, interesting. Like, wow, there's a lot of swear words yeah. for uh, a couple of young kids. Uh, but you it, know. it was one of those things where um, growing up in Iowa, like there's not opportunities to make movies yeah. back there. And so you kind of take it into your own hands. And it's something we've tried to like, perpetuate in terms of like we're always writing scripts like that are just in a vacuum like on spec like nobody's asking for these scripts and that's you know a quiet place that's that's heretic like these are movies that we just really want to see on screen and and we want to find a way to make them hell or high water and it's it's something that we feel is is um 
we want to see more of. Like we want to see more original films that are don't have to be sequels or remakes or IP because mm-hmm. that was what we grew up on. Like in the 90s, seeing this fresh, like incredible wave of filmmakers that came up during that era and just kind of blew our hair back in terms of the stories that they were telling and how cinematic they were telling them too. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Is there anything that you guys like made as kids that you want to adapt? Like, <laughs> you, like, are there any ideas like, oh, that was actually now that we're like, you know, older and seasoned. Yeah. You yeah. never know. Yeah. You there, never know. There's like maybe one or two, but I mean, most of them, like, they're horrible. They're, they're I mean, awful. there would be like, they're, they're almost horror no movies reason. Of themselves. To... Yeah. So, yeah. so they're not on yeah. YouTube for everyone's <laughs> No, I no. Hope not. We, we, we keep them, you know, not digi- digital. So, yeah. 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 They, yeah. What, what were they, were they on? V- VHS, VHS back, VHS back, then, back yeah. then. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, he, he was talking about why he did this. He said, you know, I'm cool. A24 is cool. You guys, I love also how you describe this as the genre to this movie as A24. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, how is how has that experience been different for you work, work, working with A twenty four? They're they're the they're the best um, studio in the business for a reason, mm-hmm. um, and we learned that working with that we've been you know we're a part of the cult of A twenty four like mm-hmm. ever since Bling Ring and like on and on like we we really have admired their output um, o- over the years. But um, working with them, you're like, oh, this is why they have great taste. They're really collaborative. They're really nice and friendly, mm-hmm. and they love artists and they love respecting their filmmakers. and And it's just a, it's a it's a you know it's not always a healthy environment in film. Um, it, it, you know you you hope it you always hope for the best, but A twenty four is great. Yeah, it's just it was such a you know best experience of our careers hands down working with them. Mm-hmm. 